Welcome to Bethlehem United Methodist Church and our 815 service. If you're visiting with us, we especially want to thank you for joining us and hope that you feel at home and, and experience God's presence and blessing as we, as we worship together. Also want to welcome those of you who have, have joined us online. If you have celebrations or God sightings or prayer requests, jot those down in the comment section and we'll share those a little bit later. We'll be singing together. Our new worship leader, Daniel Fiamongo, will be singing for us. We get to hear him again. Excited about that. And um, uh, Cade Botts, our, our uh, online worship coordinator, who also did his banjo debut with the, with the bluegrass band at the Fish Fries here. So welcome, you guys. We look forward to, to worshiping with you and, and, and serving with you. Um, we're recovering a little bit from a huge night on, on Friday uh, as, we, as we move towards worship. And if you have online, uh, our, our, our silent auction items, Jen and, and some, some other helpers will be down in the, in the large youth area from 9.30 on to about 3 o'clock today. So you can pick those up. Let's uh, join to get our hearts together and worship God in the spirit of, of truth and holiness. When we say come as you are, we mean it. Open hands. is never easy for us. We are a culture of instant response. Today, God is asking us to wait, to be patient. God, open our hearts and quiet our spirits that we might hear and respond to your word today. And we're going to remain standing as we sing our hymn of praise near to the heart of God. It's found in 472 in the United Methodist Hymnal.
us join in our historic confession of the Christian faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sit at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. and concerns time, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm just going to share my little poem. You might have heard it on my interview or, or in other settings. It's, it's not Shakespeare. Uh, it probably won't be published, you know, for uh, perpetu perpetuity or, or anything, but here it goes. It's not my job to cook the food or park the cars or sing the songs at the Bethlehem United Methodist Church fish fry. It's just my job to make sure not one drop of rain falls from the sky. So I have a celebration. Um, you know, so, someone asked me how, how I made it through. I said, well, there was only one little second when I thought I might not make it through. It was about 6.20. I was taking my food up to the, to the table back in the Shady Grove area, and a drop of rain hit me. I, that, that almost did me in, but fortunately, uh, we did great with the weather. We had, I, from what I've understood, from what I've heard, we've had about 2,500. We had about 2,500 ticket sales, which means that we're coming back. I know the silent auction went great. Uh, and again, if you need to pick up silent item auctions, you can do that uh, uh, until 3 o'clock today. Um, they'll, be, they'll, they'll be here following this service to, to take care of those. Where else have you seen God at work, or what uh, prayer requests would you like to share? April? I'll just add on to fish fry. I felt like we had more young families this year than I remember seeing in the kids' area. So, of course, the weather was fabulous, but it was really great to see families playing together and staying together. And um, I didn't see anybody on their cell phone. So what a nice time to just come together as a family and spend time together. Amen. Uh, okay, sorry. Just tagging on to the fish fry piece, um, I was driving a golf cart, and people are always so happy when, you know, and full when they leave. But one of the people said, you know, just to make sure that everybody knew that everybody they saw with a fish fry T-shirt they said that they were the kindest, most warm group that they've met. So oh. it's just a true reflection of who I think we are as a group. Great. Now that's an answer to prayer. Thank you so much. Uh, Sonny down here, Kevin. Yeah, Kevin wouldn't let us use our cell phones in the fish fry shed while we're cooking. I don't know. <laughs> he yes. I think the, the fish fry went great. Uh, a lot of people that uh, were not members of our church uh, commented on it and they wouldn't miss it again. Those, I said at a table that people, this is their eighth year, I think, something like that. And I also learned a lesson. Don't ever try to outbid the minister. <laughs> <laughs> no, not when an original painting by Janelle Mayer is, in, is involved. You, you probably won't win that one. Um, Please pray for, the, for Julie Watson and the family of, of, of Gail Watson. She died on, on Thursday. 
that service will be here. The service of death and resurrection will take place in the church Saturday at 11 o'clock. The gravesite will actually take place on Wednesday at 10 o'clock at, at Mount Olivet. I'm meeting them a little bit later, but uh, if you want to jot those down and, and, or, or just watch for emails to follow. It's good to have Sean back with us. We've been praying for you and the loss of your wife. We love you and thinking about you. Um, are there other, other prayer requests or concerns, Kev? Yeah, just a, uh, just a special thank you to everybody that worked down in the pit, as we call it, and loading fish, and their are handless boxes. It was a great group, a lot of hard work, and uh, thanks for your help. Pray for Richard Williams had surgery this week, and uh, someone told me uh, that he did, he was able to go home, but wanted to continue to keep him and Sylvia in our prayers. Yeah. Yeah, Glenn spent all day in the hospital Friday and then all Saturday morning scrubbing grease off the fish fry shed floor. And it, it was wondering why I wouldn't let him ha hand tables up to the attics. Like, well, you were in the hospital yesterday. Zach, you heard it. You were there. So, all right. Any other prayer re re requests or celebrations? If not, let's spend a moment in quiet reflection as we approach God in prayer. Loving God, summer is just about halfway over. We had a great fish fry. We're planning for Kathy's backpacks for next week. We look forward to welcoming new staff members to our church family. You've blessed us in, in so many ways. We pray for our members who are traveling today to attend weddings or away on vacation for those with with new jobs, with new opportunities to serve you. We pray that you would mold us all into the image of your son, that, that his care for his disciples would lead us into new relationships with one another, that his gentle love for children would inspire our efforts to nurture our children and our young people in faith. And we pray that his courage before the cross would give us strength to face life's trials and that his resurrection would instill in us a new confidence to bring us to new life. We pray for the concerns that have been identified for the celebrations and, and God sightings and for others that we lift silently in our hearts now before you. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to care about the things that, that you care about. We pray that you would empower us to trust you to do the things for ourselves and for our world that we can't do on our own. Your grace is measureless. Your kingdom is not bound by this earth and is not limited by our understanding. But we pray that you would help us to rise to new heights <clears throat> of the life that you have for us and to live and pray as you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen
Backpacks Day. I, I hope you'll join us during the Sunday school hour to, to pack those and get them ready for the children this fall. It's always a fun intergenerational activity. Some of us old people get to hang out with the children that day, and that's always fun. If you would like to contribute to that project, uh, in addition to your regular giving, it'll really help out. They've requested, I think, 82 more backpacks than last year, and we're still trying to, to meet that expense, and we appreciate your faithfulness and, and generosity. If our ushers are ready, we'll receive this morning's offering. Let us pray. Lord, receive our gifts and our lives. Cause all of these blessings to work for you in this world, which you've loaned to us for safekeeping. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. as we sing the doxology.
join Miss April at the front for children's time. What was your favorite thing about the fish fry? Anybody have a favorite? The bouncy house. The bouncy house. Um, the baseball bounce. The baseball bounce. That was pretty cool. <coughs> Did anybody smell the fish in the air? I don't even eat fish, and I could smell it, and it smelled so good. You know, another of my favorite was seeing people like Bethany and Sean, even our young youth helping. So many of our youth were helping in the kids' area. That was awesome. Do you think Jesus ever went to a fish fry? Uh. Huh. Can I, I want to share one of my very favorite stories with you. And I want you to listen to see if Jesus is at a fish fry, Okay. So the story setting is when Jesus was arrested, he, his friends, his followers, ran away and hid because they were scared. But one of his followers, Peter, who was a friend of Jesus, kind of stayed behind the guards. And then he came and started to warm his hands by a fire in the courtyard where the guards had taken Jesus. And as he was around the fire, kind of like you're all around in the circle, he was warming his hands, and one of the ladies said, oh, she pointed at Peter, you were with Jesus. What do you think Peter said? I that would have been a good answer, I was. But instead he said, no, I wasn't. And then later somebody else said, you were with Jesus. What do you think he said this time? Maybe. No, he said, no, I wasn't. And then later a third person said, you were with him because your accent gives you away. The way that you talk is like Jesus. What did he say, what did he say this time? This time he said, I don't even know him. I don't know that person. And just then, a rooster crowed. On the count of three, will you make your best rooster noise? One, two, three. Er, 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 er. Well, the thing about that is Jesus had said, by the time the rooster crows, you will have said three times that you don't know me. And Peter loved Jesus. He didn't think there was any way that would ever happen. But it did. Jesus had, was right. By the time the rooster crowed, Peter had said three times, I don't know Jesus. So when Jesus died and then came back to life, how do you think Peter felt? Peter didn't know what Jesus was going to say to him. So what do you do when you're sad and you're not sure what is going on? What's something you might do if you're sad? Pray. Pray. Peter decided to do what he always did, something that he was just comfortable with. And he went out in the boat fishing. So he used nets to fish, right? He's out in the boat fishing. And maybe, the Bible doesn't say this, but I think maybe he smelled something in the air. What do you think that is? And when he smelled something in the air, I think it made him look over on the beach and he saw somebody's on the beach who is it jesus. it's jesus now what's peter gonna do get he didn't get scared thankfully peter jumped out of the boat took off his coat jumped out and started swimming for the shore to see jesus and Jesus had made another fire, a different fire, that Peter came to warm himself around that fire. And Jesus was making breakfast. What do you think he was making for breakfast? Fish. I think he was making fish. That's right. So around that fire, Jesus said, Peter, do you love me? Oh, I bet Peter was so glad to get to answer. What do you think he said? 
Yes. But then a second time, Jesus said, Peter, do you love me? What did he say? Oh, he said, yes. And then a third time, Jesus said, Peter, do you love me? Peter said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, then I want you to feed my sheep. Jesus was forgiving Peter for those three times that he said he didn't even know him. But more than that, Jesus was saying, Peter, I want you to still be my disciple. I want you to follow me, and I want you to tell other people my story. Like Jesus asked us, we all make mistakes sometimes, don't we? Peter made a big mistake, and we all make mistakes sometimes. But Jesus is patient with us, and he has big love and big forgiveness. I wonder if Peter heard that rooster crowing other times, and maybe he was on the beach with a big piece of fish just about to have a bite of it, and he would hear the rooster crow. And remember, Jesus forgives us. He's patient with us, and he wants us to come back to him and have a fresh start, a clean heart, and a fresh start at being his follower. Will you pray with me? Dear Jesus, you are so great. We are so thankful that you forgive us, and we are so thankful that we can be your friend even when we do the wrong thing. Help us to share the good news with our words and our actions to everybody around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Here we go. Amen. Now I invite all of us to stand as we sing, uh, Come Ye Thankful People, Come. Scripture this morning is from the Gospel of Matthew. This is during the teaching years of Jesus. Uh, he's taught a number of parables to the disciples, and he's teaching also to the crowds. 
And he put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in the field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the household came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? And he answered, An enemy has done this. The slave said to him, Do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds, you'd uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I'll tell the reapers, collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into into my barn. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Jim. Thanks, Dan. Will you pray with me and for me? God above us, God before us, God within us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be also, we pray, a bridge between us across which your truth can move as your word is proclaimed. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you were here last week, you might have noticed as the text was read that we're continuing our agricultural theme as part of our series called to belong. And actually, we'll continue it next week, too. We'll look at the parable of the, of the mustard seed. Last week, we heard about a foolish farmer. This farmer who took seed and scattered it in places where you would never think that that seed could grow. But it had such a shocking abundance that his crop produced 30 or 60, 100 fold what was sown. Just unheard of, an incredible increase. Sort of challenging how we might think about sharing the word of God and where we share the word of God. So in today's text, we hear about a farmer who has a wheat field. Some knucklehead, the text refers to him as an enemy, some knucklehead takes weeds, the seed of weeds, and, th- and scatters it in this farmer's wheat field after he's sown good wheat. And it's not just, it's not just any weed, but it's a weed that is almost indistinguishable from a regular wheat plant. It's even called Darnell wheat. Informally, it could even be called, let's see that word for wheat that doesn't know its father, but we're not going to call it that in this service. We're just going to refer to it as, as darnel wheat. So this enemy scatters bad seed in a farmer's field. And it's not just bad, it's poisonous. It's poisonous. So when the workers of the farmer see what's happening, they offer to go out and yank it up, get rid of those weeds, pull it up. And the farmer says, no, 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 for a number of reasons. One is because, given that it is almost indistinguishable from regular wheat, they would be pulling up more wheat than they would weeds. They would be causing more harm than good. And not only that, not only was, was the, the Darnell wheat almost indistinguishable from the regular wheat, but the root system 
of the Darnell wheat was such that it was intertwined with all plants growing around. A regular wheat plant root just kind of goes straight down. The Darnell root system was more intertwined. So if I go yanking up a Darnell wheat plant over here, I might be pulling up a regular wheat plant over here. You know, Neil, they, they tell me, Neil's one of our master gardeners, are close anyway, a lot, lot closer to master gardener than I am. And I've heard that there is a test. You can tell me whether or not this is true. I've heard there's a test to tell whether a plant is a weed or not. Anybody hear this? If, if you pull it up, if you pull up a plant and it comes up easily, it was not a weed. Right? It was not a weed. That's not going to happen. So this farmer's got all these weeds growing in his field. And the, and the slaves, the workers, offer to go and, and pull it up. And he says, no, 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 right? Well, last week I mentioned that whether parables are easy to interpret or not, you know, there's kind of different views on, on the interpretation of parables. But whether or not they're easy to interpret, parables always, or at least almost always, have a shocking element to them, or a surprise. And the surprise, or at least one surprise in the parable of the weeds and the wheat is this. There is nothing you can do about the weeds that grow in with the wheat. All you can do is wait, wait until harvest time, and then God sorts it all out. God sorts it all out. You know, there are 40 parables in the Gospels. There's the parable of the marriage feast, right? There's the parable of the ten virgins. There's the parable of the good and bad fish. There's the parable of the dishonest manager, which we looked at briefly last week. On and on, lots of parables. But I think this parable of the weeds and the wheats, if, I, if you can have a least favorite parable, it's probably my least favorite parable because it's calling me to do something I don't like to do. I don't like to wait. And I don't like to be told that there are things I can't do anything about. I don't like to hear there's a problem that I can't solve. I don't like to wait. And you can ask my wife. You can ask my mother. She'll be here at 1045. You can ask my daughter or my son. I'm not any good at it. I'm not any good at waiting. In fact, I can do a one-hour prayer meditation in three or four minutes. I'm not advising that you do that, you know, but, but I can. I can listen to a 20-minute TED Talk in 10 minutes. It's easy. You just double the speed. I do it all the time. I like to get things done. I like to take action. And, Rebecca, I don't like to be told that there are things I can't do anything about. I don't like to be told that there are problems I can't solve. And then, boom! Here comes Jesus' parable of the weeds and the wheats telling me there are things I can't figure out. There are problems that I can't solve. And in reality, that's just true. Mike, I mean no disrespect at all to the, anyone in the medical profession or Robin, but... In fact, I'm astounded at what surgeons and physicians and nurses can do. But at the end of the day, last time I checked, every physician loses 100% of their patients. You know, we, we, we eventually are going to die. We're eventually going to die. There's always going to be weeds in among the wheat. There's going to be problems that that we can't solve, that we can't figure out. Now, I watch the news too, and you know, I do a little online viewing, and, and, and I've heard, I, and I know, that there are 
Oh, politicians. Politicians that will tell you, if you vote for me, what? What do they say? What do they say? All your problems are going to go away. And trust me, I've heard it on the progressive side. I've heard it on the conservative side, the libertine side. All your problems will go away if you vote for me. And if you write in a big, fat, juicy check, that won't hurt either. But can I ask you a question? Has that happened yet? Has that happened yet? Has there been a politician promising those things that's ever fulfilled them? We still have problems. There's still weeds in among the weeds. And, and listen, we've heard a lot of those promises, haven't we? We voted for a lot of those people telling us they're going to take all our problems. It's not just politicians. There are preachers, TV preachers and others who'll say, look, if you'll buy my book, $29.99 plus shipping and handling, you're not going to have those problems those non-believers have. In fact, there's a book right now. I won't, I won't say who the author is, Joel Olstein. But anyway, there's a book right now <laughs> that's called I Am, I Am. And if you buy that book for $16.99, I'll tell you what you're going to, the, the, the way it works, is you say, I am strong. I am stress-free. I am this, I am that. And then that's what you're going to be. That's how the book works. If I bought that book, I would probably be saying, I am out $16.99 for a book that's not very good. And I'm not, I'm not saying that they're lying, preachers who say that sort of thing, but I will suggest that maybe they should read the Bible more carefully, and particularly the words of Jesus who says in John chapter 16, verse 33, in this world you will always have trouble. There are always going to be weeds in the wheat field. In this world, you will always have trouble. Or Matthew chapter 5, verse 45, the rain falls on the just and the unjust, sometimes even on fish fry day. The rain falls on the just and the unjust. Now, for the record, if I thought it would help, I would be the first to run out in the wheat field and start ripping up weeds. But I'm afraid all it would do would be to destroy the wheat field. I'm afraid if I went out there and decide which is the weed, which is the wheat, and start yanking them up, I'm going to do more harm than good. That's not to say that we should cuddle weeds. It's, it's not to say that weeds don't exist. They do. It's not to suggest that weeds are good. They're not. It's just that's not our job. It's not our job to determine what's a weed and, what's a, and, and go out there and start yanking them up. That is not our job. You know, sometimes I'm asked, when is Bethlehem going to take action on this question surrounding disaffiliation? And the short answer is, we have. We have. At the direction of the church council, I met with the chair of the church council, I met with the SBRC chair and our lay leader, and we decided that until the general conference meets to make a decision, if they even do make a decision, that there's really nothing for us to make a decision about regarding, regarding disaffiliation, and so we decided to do that thing that's not my favorite thing to do in the world, which is wait. Waiting's not easy, but waiting sure is better than making an impulsive, premature decision sometimes. You know, I guess, I guess the thing that not only breaks my heart but baffles me is why our church, why we have congregations disaffiliating over one issue when there are so many issues we, we don't agree on. Why is there one? This year it's same-sex marriage. But why will it be next, next year? 
Gluttony? In case you haven't looked, the Bible says a lot about gluttony. So do, is that going to be the next thing that divides the church into gluttons and, and non-gluttons and we have to have a glutton-free church? I don't want to be the glutton police. You know, I don't want to go out to lunch with somebody and say, oh, dude, you should not have supersized those fries. Because now i got to excommunicate you from Bethlehem. I don't want to be that guy. And then what, what comes after gluttony? Is it, is it greed? Have you noticed the Bible says a lot about greed? But I don't get a lot of pressure from people saying, I think we should do something about the greedy people in our church. I think maybe we should split off and have another church where we weed out people who are greedy. Well, how would you do that? What would the test be? Let's see. There could be many, right? Let's see. Um, you know, there are people in this world who don't have shoes, right? Don't have, they walk barefoot everywhere they go. So we could say, okay, we're going we're gonna to have a greed church and a non-greedy church. And if you have more than 20 pairs of shoes, we have to remove you from church membership. That, maybe that would be, a, or should it be 40 or two? two I, do golf shoes, in, or is that included? I don't get a lot of pressure of people wanting to disaffiliate over, over greed, but, you know, there are people who die on this, in this world because of, of greed. I mean, there's lots of issues I could go on. What about gambling? The Book of Discipline takes a pretty firm stance against all forms of, of gambling. But, you know, w one of my former churches was asked if they wanted to be the recipient of someone's earning from the lottery and it was a lot of money. It was to be split between our congregation and another, from another denomination. And guess what? We both took the money. Even though gambling is bad, according to, you know, well, um, I, there is room for discipline in the church. I'm not, I'm not saying that there's not. Matthew certainly is not saying there's not room for discipline in the church. It's spelled out in, in Matthew chapter 18. But guess what follows Matthew 18? You'll never guess. You'll never guess. Parables. More and more parables in Matthew and in Luke. They're, they're parables about a king who forgives a servant for just an unimaginable debt. It's, there's parables about women who find lost coins and, and um, shepherds who find lost sheep and fathers who throw their dignity to the wind and run down the road to embrace a ragged prodigal son. There's a place for discipline, but, but if this text is telling us anything at all, it's to be patient. It's to let God do what God does. Like separate the wheat from the weeds. The harvest is coming. And while this is maybe my, my, the parable that gives me the most trouble, I'm glad it's there because it reminds me, it reminds me God has everything taken care of. The harvest is coming. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You know, the first recorded words of Jesus in the Bible took place after he and his family went to Jerusalem for Passover. Mary and Joseph left with other family members for their village of Nazareth, thinking that Jesus was with them, but as you know, he, he wasn't, right? So they had to go back and get him. I'm not going to comment on Mary and Joseph's parenting style. I'll leave that for you therapists, but, um, but I do want to comment on what Jesus was doing. The one who created everything, 
was sitting patiently at the feet of the teachers at the temple, soaking in what they had to say, listening, waiting, and paying attention. Yes, he was 12 years old, but he was the Son of God. He was the Logos. He was the Word. He was the bread of life. He was the bright and morning star. And so today, as we respond to today's message, I want to encourage us to do what Jesus was doing in the temple those days. I want to encourage us to pray and listen for God's voice and guidance as we journey together as the family of God and followers of Jesus. And if you have not begun a journey of following Jesus, I'd love to talk to you about that if you're interested in being a disciple. If you have questions about the, about the church, joining the church, please let me know. We're called to belong as those God loves more than we could ever ask or imagine. Let's stand and, and sing together. <laughs> Inspired by the extravagant love of God, live generously with open hands, loving one another as if your lives depended on it. Be good stewards of the gifts that you have received so that God may be glorified in all that you say and do. And may the abundant love of God surround you. May the extravagant grace of Jesus Christ sustain you. And may the constant presence of the Holy Spirit inspire and encourage you in every good deed and word. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Sing that one more. 